Jonathan came to me, hey, can we do EEG in the ambulance? Regular EEG, not going to happen. It just takes too long to prepare because the, the first thing that we agreed on, it has to be very, very fast. Because if it's not fast, the ambulance is not going to use it. So what we decided first is we need the technology that we can measure EEG with in a very fast fashion. So we quickly arrived at a dry electrode EEG. So that means that you have a different type of electrode. It actually looks a bit like a, like an octopus. Uh, and uh, these are plastic electrodes coated with uh, silver silver chloride, which is an excellent uh, conductor uh, to measure uh, EEG and what you actually do is you put those on top of the hair and if you twist them a little bit they just go through the hair. We tested that electrodes in our hospital uh, at first in volunteers uh, then we tested it on patients in the outpatient clinic who actually came in for epilepsy detection so we were also uh, started looking for a software that we could actually use to measure EEG in the ambulance because all the software that we used inside the hospital actually was quite cumbersome. But in the end, we found a, a very nice partner as well in that uh, aspect, uh, which also transformed the software for us so that we could basically just fill in the number and then just click on start and the measurement would start running. This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Hello and welcome to the Recovery After Stroke podcast. Since I mentioned my book at the beginning of episode 276, we've discovered a few things that need updating and that information has been sent back to the team and shortly, fingers crossed, the book will be ready to launch. But as I was last week, I'm still giving away the first chapter free. The feedback from it so far has been fantastic. The book is called The Unexpected Way That the Stroke Became the Best Thing That Happened. And it shares 10 secrets from stroke survivors that will transform your life. If you go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash book and fill out the form, you will receive the book in your email a few moments later. If you are a stroke survivor with a story to share about your stroke experience, now is the perfect time to join me on the show. The interviews are not scripted. You do not have to plan for them. You just need to be a stroke survivor who wants to share your story in the hope that it will help someone else who is going through something similar. If you are a researcher who wants to share the findings of a recent study, or you are looking to recruit people into your studies, you may also wish to reach out and be a guest on my show. If you have a commercial product that you would like to promote that is related to supporting stroke survivors to recover, there is also a path for you to join me on a sponsored episode of the show. Just go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash contact, fill out the form explaining briefly which category you belong to, and I will respond with more details about how we can connect via Zoom. This is episode 277, and my guest today is co-founder of Trionect. Wouter Potters. Trinect is a Dutch company that is developing the Stroke Pointer, which is a portable EEG device, otherwise known as an electroencephalogram that can be used in ambulances to help detect large vessels, large vessel occlusions, which are a type of ischemic stroke, while the patient is in transit to hospital so that they are transported to the correct hospital that has the facilities to treat such medical emergencies, saving time in transit and decreasing the possibility of the patient being sent to a hospital that is not able to treat such conditions and therefore reducing the amount of time between when the stroke patient starts to show symptoms of stroke and when treatment begins, therefore saving brain and decreasing the impact stroke has on the patient. Walter Potters, welcome to the podcast. Thanks a lot, Bill. It's a joy to be here. Thank you for being honor. here. Thank you for being here because I really get excited when I see technology uh, that is about saving brain. I really get excited. But before we talk about the technology and what you guys are working on and developing, give me a little bit of a background about you first and then also about the organization that um, you're involved in. Yeah, so uh, 
I started out my, uh, my study as a technical physician, which is already quite unique for the Netherlands because it's really at the boundary of medicine, uh, science and innovation. Uh, and it also includes two years full time in academic hospitals. So that means that you get trained in the hospital uh, together with the entire team at the hospital. Uh, and you also get involved with patients and with patient care. And in the Netherlands, we're also allowed to treat patients. So this is my education. So I did not do medicine. I did technical uh, medicine. And uh, after that, I did a PhD in MRI. And then I started uh, my career at neurology, which is actually where this project started. And in uh, the neurology field, I was a staff member for seven years. And uh, during that time, I also met my, uh, my colleague, uh, Jonathan Coutinho, a stroke neurologist. And he actually came up with the problem that he saw a lot of patients that were actually uh, inside the hospital and that were actually uh, being treated for a stroke, actually for a large vessel occlusion stroke. And half of those patients actually came from another hospital where they could not treat these patients. So we really saw a, a problem there. And that's actually when we decided we wanted to fix that problem together. That's a huge problem. So before we talk about the problem and your solution, let's talk about your PhD in MRI. Yes, that's correct. Okay, that's a cool PhD. Tell me about that a little bit. Give me a, a bit of an idea of what your main focus of your study was that got you to that um, outcome. Yeah, so, so it's really, uh, it was a totally different field because the PhD was in the radiology department uh, where I actually studied uh, the, the flow inside blood vessels and more specifically the velocity of blood inside blood vessels. So this is actually at a very basic research. Uh, we just are looking at how blood flows within the blood vessel. And what's very interesting about that is that in the very, very early phases of atherosclerosis, which is also highly relevant for, for stroke, is that if actually the blood goes in circles or uh, over the heartbeat, it, it goes uh, in different directions next to the vessel wall, that means that the blood flow is not in a streamlined uh, next to the vessel wall, which means that the endothelial cells at the vessel wall they tend to disalign uh, as soon as the, uh, as the blood flow is not just laminar in one direction with high velocity, but also creates low velocities and uh, or varying velocities. You actually get uh, these endothelial cells, they rearrange, which uh, makes them more prone to actually infiltration of inflammatory uh, substances from the blood into the vessel wall which then in the very long term, uh, the hypothesis is then that that can create atherosclerosis. And in the long term, we know uh, that that can also create, uh, induce a stroke if it happens in the brain. Does atherosclerosis induce an ischemic stroke or hemorrhagic stroke? Uh, mostly, no, it induces ischemic stroke. Okay. And that's because you've got the blood flow, microscopic changes in the blood flow in the way that it creates high pressures and low pressures inside the blood vessel and as a result creates blood clots that form on the blood vessels and then get released into the bloodstream and then maybe perhaps into the brain yeah and it's, it's, it's even a little bit more complicated than that because the the blood flow uh, uh, flows next to the endothelial cells and you can see them as like small uh, little blobs uh -huh. And if the blood flow is really uh, straightforward in one uh, straight in one direction, then these cells nicely align and they form you know, a little bit elongated cells and they're really tightly packed together. And as soon as the blood flow changes, so not the pressure, but really the, the blood flow, the velocity next to the vessel wall, actually that alignment that is also protecting uh, the vessel wall itself uh, actually uh, disaligns a bit. And then you get a very, very slow buildup of uh, inflammatory inducing uh, substances uh, in the vessel wall. And that attracts then other cells and they build up and they slowly, very slowly uh, produce a, a plaque, as it's called, inside wow. the vessel wall. And if that plaque at some points becomes very big or if, it's, uh, if, it, if there is some incident so that it ruptures, 
then actually it can create a stroke instantaneously, an ischemic stroke, because then there is uh, a sudden uh, uh, clotting of the blood uh, next to uh, the part where actually uh, uh, the atherosclerosis is, and then uh, you can get an immediate block of the vessel, or it can produce uh -huh. like small clots that uh -huh. shoot to your brain or to other body parts. Uh huh. Okay. That's fascinating. It's plumbing 101. I I, I say that why I say that because yeah. I I've seen I've seen some weird uh, YouTube documentaries about different things, and every once in a while you come up against something like plumbing and why a copper pipe gets damaged on the inside, and it's not dissimilar to what you just described. It's because of the way that the pipe was joined or welded or the the flow of the water over the joints and over the welds and a simple change in the flow of the water over the weld and on the inside can cause the join to deteriorate far more rapidly than one mm -hmm. would hope. And under, you know, severe load or changes in the weather uh, because of, um, you know, colder climates in different countries, et cetera, you can have different versions of, uh, life cycles on these pipes and different reasons why they burst. So, um, it's fascinating how that what you mentioned is very much applicable to any kind of tube that runs a liquid through it for whatever purposes, but specifically in this, in our situation, uh, we're talking about stroke. So is atherosclerosis something that is obvious that it's been happening for uh, a long time? Is there early warning signs of atherosclerosis? Can somebody, without looking at your habits, can somebody look at a blood vessel and go, this blood vessel is going to be, um, what's the word? Is it, is it impacted by atherosclerosis in 5, 10, 12 years, something like that? Yeah, it's, it's really difficult to state this in a really general matter because there's many patients with many different uh, also pre-existing diseases. Uh, yeah. So everything depends on that. So, and what we usually do in the clinic that uh, patients get symptoms. Uh, so sometimes uh, they uh, get uh, neurological symptoms. Uh, sometimes the, the atherosclerosis can also be uh, present in other body parts, for example, legs, if somebody has uh, trouble walking or uh, people uh, uh, have less blood flow to their, uh, to their legs. So they can also have problems with their legs or with their arms. That can actually be a first warning sign. Uh, and based on those first warning signs uh, at the hospital, my colleagues at the radiology department can decide to do, for example, in uh, ultrasound. And uh, with the ultrasound uh, in the neck, you can, for example, uh, look for a constricted blood vessel, uh, constricted or, uh, or actually uh, yeah, in the artery with atherosclerosis in the neck uh, to see if that's present or not. And what they then basically do is they look at uh, the lumen of the vessel. And if the lumen is smaller, uh, you can actually state that if it's much, much smaller than, for example, two centimeters below, you can actually state there is now a stenosis in this blood vessel, so a decrease of the lumen of, for example, 80%. And uh, once you have a constriction of 80%, it's already severely uh, uh, well limited in terms of how much blood can flow through there. Yeah. And if it becomes more, uh, then you also get at the stage where it gets symptomatic. So it means that then also people get problems from this stenosis. Because also the blood vessels, although they're really big, there's also two or some uh, even uh, four huge blood vessels going uh, to the brain. So that means if one is constricted, that does not mean that there is necessarily a problem because there are still a lot of other blood vessels all the blood vessels in your brain are connected by the circle of Willis, which is a sort of a circular a structure of blood vessels. So a lot can be compensated by your own body already, which is quite amazing. It's fascinating. The technical amazement, the body is just so fascinating. I mean, clearly whoever designed it did a great job and um, really made a point of protecting the brain almost at all costs, uh, two vertebral arteries and two, um, 
uh, the carotid arteries, carotid yeah. arteries, and yeah, it's just fabulous. And um, let's face it, most people have had a stroke if it wasn't for that amazing uh, way that the brain has been developed and the access that it has to blood from many, many different uh, locations. Most of us wouldn't be around. Um, so it's very good. I'm very grateful that uh, that it's like that. Also, what it means is that sometimes stroke survivors ignore the signs of stroke because something doesn't suggest necessarily that a stroke is happening. They have headaches or they have all these weird things going on. Yes. And often that leads them to giving information to perhaps 911 in America or triple zero in Australia or whichever the organization is in, um, in the Netherlands. What is it by the way, in the Netherlands that uh, in Europe, it's one, one, two, one, one, two. Um, it tends to allow people to give the wrong information to the people that are going to help them. And then as a result of that, we end up perhaps waiting in an emergency room or going, like you said, to the wrong hospital. And that then increases the risk of severe uh, complications because of stroke. And then sometimes uh, you hear about people who have had a stroke. I've interviewed people who have had a stroke and three, four, five days later have gone to finally get help from somebody at a hospital. And then they're always lamenting that I should have known better. I should have gone earlier, et cetera. Now yeah. we should have and could have, but we didn't. And that doesn't matter. What matters is that what you're working on is a way to predict way before somebody presents to the hospital and has to wait in emergency perhaps, and then has to wait for a scan and all those things you're presenting the possibility that stroke survivors can be supported in the ambulance so that decisions can be made while they are in transit to hospital so that they go to the correct, A, correct hospital, and then B, uh, when they get there, there's no guessing as to what might be the challenge with this person. There might be information already available to triage so that they can get processed appropriately tell me a little bit about that yeah yeah first to get back to you the first part of your uh, question the introduction people not recognizing symptoms of stroke that's extremely common in stroke patients so that's uh, really the neglect that they don't have the possibility or the ability to see that uh, there's a stroke going on because Obviously, the brain's affected, so that does not help. Uh, so it's really important that people in the environment really recognize these fast signals. So really uh, facial expressions, arms uh, not dropping or not moving, really recognize, know those signs, recognize those signs. Yeah. And if you see them, uh, just call 911 and explain what you see very objectively. That That's already very important. And then the next step, if the ambulance arrives, that's where actually we come in. So uh, I've been working at Amsterdam UMC for seven years. And in 2018, we had the idea to try a stroke patients inside uh, the ambulance because we saw that a, half of these ambulances in the Netherlands at least drive to the wrong hospital. And then these patients get picked up again by a second ambulance, usually around 60 minutes later on average. And then they get transported to their uh, best therapy. And we all know time is brain. So this delay can be quite destructive for individuals, uh, meaning not going back to work, going back to work, uh, living in a nursing home, living back home. Mm. So the differences are really huge in terms of individual patients. Uh, and what our aim was, we wanted to develop a triage instrument that could be used in every ambulance by any ambulance personnel across the world. Uh, and also it should be uh, accurate, of course, because we want to accurately depict which patients has to go where. 
And uh, most specifically, we wanted to detect the large vessel occlusion strokes. So that's a very specific type of ischemic stroke. And the reason why we focus so much on that specific uh, subtype of stroke is because uh, in 2015, there has been a lot of uh, clinical trials that actually showed that endovascular treatment was very, very beneficial over regular uh, thrombect uh, thrombolysis. Uh, and that actually changed the entire field of stroke care uh, in the sense that people with stroke now get endovascular treatment where they actually go into the blood vessel and pull out the large blood clots. Uh -huh. uh, the big downside of that is it only works in the big vessels because that's where you can get with these uh, catheters. Uh, but if you can manage to get the blood clot out, time is brain. That's the first thing that's important. Uh, so that, and the second thing that's an important that you really bring the patients as fast as possible to the right hospital. Uh, and inside the ambulance, we cannot diagnose stroke because we need the CT scan right now to diagnose stroke. So, uh, well, long story short, uh, we decided to uh, discuss what technology we can use to actually diagnose stroke. And we came up with uh, the EEG, so the electroencephalography or the brainwave measurements, as we call it. And these brainwave measurements, they really change almost instantaneously when you uh, suffer from a stroke because the okay. blood vessel uh, closes uh, or is blocked. And once the blood vessel is blocked, uh, there is no oxygen and no uh, glucose uh, supplied to your uh, brain cells. And that means that the, uh, the activity of the brain cells immediately drops. And we knew this already because we use this technique already in the hospital. For example, in patients where they operate on one of the carotid arteries to remove, for example, atherosclerosis, we use this technology to measure the brain to make sure that nothing happens to the brain during the surgery. Uh -huh. And as soon as you uh, close one of the vessels and you see uh, that something's going wrong in the brain, that means that the other vessels do not compensate enough to actually uh, compensate for that blocked vessel, uh, which is essentially also what happens in strokes. So if one vessel gets blocked, a large vessel, then the uh, area behind that vessel no longer is supplied with oxygen, and you immediately see a change in brain waves. What you see is slowing of the brain waves, uh, less activity, uh, and this is what we're trying to measure with EEG. Uh huh. So EEG sounds familiar because. Uh, most people will know about the ECG, the yes. electrocardiograph, right? Yeah, it's essentially the ECG for the brain, as we call it. Right, okay. So the EEG is something, is a technology that has already been used. It's got good track record, and it's usually used in the operating room. So it has a good track record. It has been used since the 1980s. Uh, when people still used uh, papers and needles with ink to actually uh, measure EEG. Yeah. Uh, and the, it, in the hospital, it's mostly used inside the neurology department, where they actually are using it to uh, mostly diagnose patients who are suspected of epilepsy. Because in uh, epilepsy, you have a sudden onsets of huge activity uh, inside uh, the brain. And you can, uh, if you have an e, uh, if you get an EEG, you can actually try to detect those events. Uh, so that's what it's used been for mainly, also for sleep research. So people who have uh, trouble uh, at night with breathing or sleeping, or uh, they also get an EEG uh, together with all kind of other measurements to also uh, measure that. So that's in the hospital and for monitoring during surgery. It's also been used a lot. For example, surgeries on the the biggest vessels that you have in your in your body, the biggest mm -hmm. arteries. You always want to make sure that your brain is not uh, affected during the surgery, because then you would end up after the surgery with brain damage. So that's also where a lot of this monitoring uh, takes place as well. And the monitoring is usually sticky pads stuck on the head. Is that how it usually looks? That are connected uh, to so for the 
Yeah, well, for the monitoring, actually, you want to be 100% sure that it's correctly. So actually, for the monitoring, they actually oh. screw these electrodes in the in the head of the uh, of the uh, of the patient. Uh, but there's not a lot of electrodes then. Uh, but they actually really are very tightly coupled with the skin, so that there's really a, it's a single use electrode, and they just twist it into the skin, and a bit like a screwdriver, but then very very tiny. Yep. which makes sure that the contact is really perfect. And uh -huh. inside the neurology department, it really looks like uh, either a cap with uh, 32 uh, electrodes or more, sometimes even uh, 256 uh, or 512 electrodes. And then each electrode that is put onto the brain is actually connected to the, to the skin uh, with uh, a little bit of uh, glue uh, or a little bit of... Uh, yeah, more like a gel. So you can imagine that if you have to attach all those electrodes, it, it takes a lot of time. So for 32 time. electrodes, two people, they're, I think they're busy for 10 minutes, and then all the uh, electrodes are connected to the skin. Okay, so for me, because I'm a novice and, and it's okay, I, I see, I, I hear about technology, we're already using it inside the hospital. We're already using it in the operating rooms. Just take it and put it in the ambulance. No big deal, right? It should be simple. Just yeah. However, the process is clearly not as simple as let's just take it and put it in the ambulance. Explain to me the thinking behind put, getting it in the ambulance and how you guys have to then change what is all what, what is almost been proven to be really effective in one location change it so that it continues to be effective in a different setting where the parameters are very different you're in a car the car is moving you don't have all the equipment you don't have a lot of technicians on hand you have yeah. ambulance drivers who are potentially uh paramedics and who are not necessarily doctors don't have the skill in this area my God, all the things that you guys would have had to solve to put this in an ambulance, it just seems like a, a massive project. Tell me a little bit about yeah. the transition from inside the hospital to in the ambulance. Yeah, so so the first thing we did is we, we uh, because Jonathan, at this point, this is actually the point where actually Jonathan came to me, hey, can we do EEG in the ambulance? And uh, we were like, okay, regular EEG, not going to happen. It just takes too long to prepare because the, the first thing that we agreed on, it has to be very, very fast. Because if it's not fast, the ambulance is not going to use it for good reason, because these patients have to get to the hospital as soon as possible. So you cannot spend 10 minutes on electrodes and then hoping that it will go right and then uh, do this in a trial or in a study for in three and more than 300 patients. That's just not ethical. So what we decided first is we need the technology that we can measure EEG with in a very fast fashion. So we quickly arrived at a dry electrode uh, EEG. So that means that you have a different type of electrode. It actually looks a bit like a, like an octopus. Uh, and uh, these are plastic electrodes coated with uh, silver silver chloride, which is an excellent uh, conductor uh, to measure uh, EEG and what you actually do is you put those on top of the hair and if you twist them a little bit they just go through the hair and this was actually back in 2018 uh, there were just a few new innovations in this uh, in this area uh, and one of our partners uh, just released a just a commercial product that could measure uh, dry electrode EEG and we thought well we're going to need that uh, specific uh, product and we're going to test it. So that's what we first did. We tested that electrodes in our hospital uh, at first in volunteers. Uh, then we tested it on patients in the outpatient clinic who actually came in for epilepsy detection. And we just asked them after the measurements, do you want to participate in a study just to check these, check out these new electrodes? Well, and at some point we thought, well, okay, this is going to work. So we were also uh, started looking for a software that we could actually use to measure EEG in the ambulance because all the software that we used inside the hospital actually was quite cumbersome. A lot of uh, clicks, a lot of training required just to, just to basically click on start measurements. 
So, but in the end, we found a, a very nice partner as well in that uh, aspect, uh, which also transformed the software for us so that we could basically just fill in the number. That was, a, that was the start and then just click on start and the measurement would start running. Uh, and that's actually uh, what we've been using then. Uh, and the other thing was it needed to be portable. So we created a nice uh, yeah, aluminum suitcase was uh, I think uh, about uh, this big and we actually had the suitcase and we also tested with this suitcase successfully in our emergency department because we were just uh, stepping it up a little bit we didn't want to start in acute patients but once we were sure that the technology worked we could actually validate in these acute stroke patients which are often uh, uh, very severe patients. So they're also really hard to instruct uh, sometimes. So we really wanted to validate that this would work within five minutes from start to end. And we did this at the emergency department also in quite a lot of uh, patients. And we saw, okay, now we, now we think this is gonna work. And we were already in discussions with ambulance uh, services as well. Uh, first Ambulance Amsterdam, uh, that was the first uh, ambulance company that we collaborated with. So we went with the suitcase to them and we said, well, we have this and this ID for the study and we want to place this device in your ambulance. And they were looking at this and they said, no, it's far too heavy. We're not gonna carry that. And they said, come with us. So we went to the ambulance and actually uh, they showed us what they had to carry to each patient where they went and we thought, okay, we have to rethink this. And they, they actually uh, some of the ambulance personnel there was very helpful. So they also showed us what they would want uh, in order to improve this. So we quickly just got all the equipment out of our aluminum suitcase and just repackaged it in a lighter, uh, lightweight bag. And from there, we continued uh, with our first study, uh, which actually included 12 ambulances because later on a second ambulance company actually joins. Uh, and then the next step was really to train all the ambulance personnel. So we trained 125 ambulance uh, personnel, uh, which was quite a lot, but thanks to our uh, PhD students, uh, that was all performed in a very, very short time frame. Wow. And then we just started measuring. Uh, and at the start, there were still uh, a lot of hurdles because uh, data quality is, was and is a major uh, issue. Uh, with EEG, because uh, if you compare it to ECG, it's a factor thousand uh, lower in terms of uh, signal uh, strength. So it's a really small signal that we're trying to measure. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we slowly uh, got the software better and better to also uh, prepare, uh, for example, to look at the contact quality with the skin. Uh, and well, at the end of the study, we got to a point where we could actually uh, measure correctly around 65% uh, of the patients, which is still not sufficient, but to prove the general principle that we can use EEG for uh, stroke, the large vessel occlusion stroke in the ambulance, that was more than sufficient because we knew that the technology can be improved because we have many ideas to improve it. Actually, there's a new study going on that already implements some of those improvements uh, for, the, for the headset, for the cap. Uh, and we have new uh, developments going on also within the company to further improve data quality uh, and also to provide feedback to the ambulance personnel while they're measuring, because that's really important. That's something we did not do in the first study. Man, it just sounds amazing. So the study, the initial study with the 120 uh, ambulance personnel uh, that went into their ambulances, did it reveal the type of information that you were hoping? And as a result, did that mean that you guys got patients to the right hospital instead of the wrong hospital? Yeah, so we got the right information, but we only knew this after we analyzed the data. So that's oh. always uh, the problem. Uh, nobody actually ever measured inside the ambulance, or at least nobody published about it. Uh, and uh -huh. so we did not have the data uh, on beforehand uh, that we could actually, yeah, we knew it from the emergency department, but the downside of the emergency department is that's always later than the ambulance. So we did not know what we would find in the ambulance yet. We had some ideas, uh, but we did not write an algorithm yet that could make a decision. And okay. uh, it would be unethical if we would have made a decision already then. Uh, so oh. the first study really was about collecting data, data. and afterwards uh, deciding 
if we would have made a decision using this algorithm, would this patient then be brought to the right hospital, yes or no? Uh, and so this is what we did. We did, developed an algorithm based on the data we collected and then retrospectively looked, if we would have used this algorithm, would that have helped this LVO stroke patient, yes or no? And you, you got some positive results. Absolutely, yeah. So we had a 90% accuracy, 91% uh, actually for one of the uh, parameters, 80% uh, uh, accuracy for one of the other parameters, but it basically means that we can detect the LVO strokes really, really well. Uh, but at the same time, there is also uh, a small portion of the non-LVO stroke, so other diagnosis that we also detected as an LVO stroke. Uh, which means they also get brought to a very comprehensive stroke center where they can also be excellently treated. So, right. That's fascinating. So then there's another level of training that needs to occur because what you're hoping is that, are you hoping that the data is going to be able to be live in the field, uh, understood, and then therefore the people in the ambulance make the decision, or does that data get sent elsewhere? and then information gets sent back to the ambulance about where to send that patient. If you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. Yeah. So both options are possible. Uh, we have a very strong preference for making the decision uh, in the ambulance uh, because ambulance personnel is very independent and uh, because they're very independent they're also really fast because if you have to call somebody send data even if it's all automated and then wait for the call back it costs you a few minutes and yeah. in stroke every second counts so why not do everything on site uh, as much as possible because we do do uh, the measurement before we start driving uh, because we don't want artifacts from driving because you never know if there's a roundabout or if there's a okay. bumps in the road that's this will cause artifacts and you never know when they will happen uh, so we measure while we're still standing still uh, and then we do the measurements and the idea is then that our algorithm that we now developed uh, will be used to make a decision and then the ambulance personnel uh, can use that decision from the algorithm to actually decide I'm going to this hospital or I'm going to this hospital. And there's many more options because there's a lot of different regions, a lot of different countries. The distances in Australia are much different uh, from the distances in uh, the Netherlands. For example, we don't take stroke patients with a plane from one region to another region. I think in Australia, this does happen. So there's yeah. a lot of different uh, situations and countries uh, where actually the same algorithm uh, might provide a different outcome because you have to take into account the likelihood of a large vessel occlusion stroke, but you also have to take into account that in some countries it takes three hours to actually get the patients to uh, large vessel occlusion stroke uh, treatment. So these are all factors that need to be taken into account. Yeah, in Australia, some people live three, four, five hours away from the nearest hospital, let alone nearest stroke unit. Yes. So we have, um, we have the Royal Flying Doctors, which offers a service to pick up people in airplanes and bring them back to hospital. So there's that. And then there's also um, just depending on, you know, where near the metropolitan area people live, how easy, how easily accessible it is to get to a, uh, a hospital where we'll, they'll, they'll be flown in by a helicopter, for example, if they are an hour away and 
road traffic conditions would mean that perhaps that trip would take two or three hours. Uh, mm -hmm. So they get uh, halivac into the hospitals um, three, well, at least in Melbourne, there's at least, I think, three or four major hospitals that accept helicopter patients. Yes. Uh, so it's so it's amazing that you're going to be able to take the technology out of the out of the hospital and then bring it into the ambulance. The ambulance is an absolute mar marvel of modern medicine. It's just the most miraculous thing that exists. The things that paramedics can do and achieve for people uh, is fascinating. I'm I know. I know lots of people have had a stroke and have not been able to detect that they were having a stroke because they didn't know they were too young, never came across a fast uh, message, never knew anybody who had a stroke, uh, assumed it was one thing or another, or need to make needed to make a decision about, I need to get to work today because if I don't get to work, I'm going to lose my job. And then as a result of those decisions, then they don't go back to work at all. And um, yes. this situation would really impact the lives of a lot of people. Now, it's it seems really exciting. And it seems like this is a project that's going to come to fruition very, very quickly. Uh, it should be very soon. But the process isn't very quick, is it? How long has the project been bubbling away yeah. and developing this uh, possibility? Yeah, developing new technology within medicine is uh, is a long path, uh, also for good reason, uh, mm. because if you put something into uh, into daily practice, you have to be absolutely sure that it works all the time. And so it did not, does not add additional risk. So that's one. Uh, and you just need a ton of evidence uh, before it gets accepted, because the entire uh, medical field already is very very expensive at least that's the case here in the netherlands uh, and if you add new technology uh, usually that would mean that it would become more expensive uh, so you also need to gain a lot if you want to make uh, medicine more expensive because in the end we all need to pay for it together so uh, i think that payability and affordability of care is very very important uh, but I also think that our technology can contribute something there because we think that in the end, uh, what we did is we created algorithms uh, in a scientific context because I worked at Amsterdam UMC, was an employee there and a researcher. And we created this study from 2018 to 2022. We actually included patients, 389. And from that, uh, we derived that this was a feasible project. We could detect LVO stroke in the ambulance. And this is actually the point where we said, okay, we can do it. Now what? What's the next step? Because yeah. we could end there and then we would have a nice scientific publication in neurology and then the project would end. And then we would hope that somebody else would pick up uh, in order to make this reality. But uh, we actually decided, yes, we want to do this. So that's why I quit my job actually at the Amsterdam UMC. Uh, so I quit my staff position uh, and uh, together with uh, two colleagues, uh, Jonathan Coutinho and Hank McQuering, and also with uh, a colleague, uh, a former partner we would collaborate with from Berlin, uh, Frank Zanov, we started uh, Trianect. Uh, and Trianect is a spin-off company from the university, from the Amsterdam UMC. And at Trianect, we are now trying to valorize the knowledge that we created uh, in our research. So we're transforming the research that we did into a uh, medical product uh, that can uh, be approved by notified bodies uh, with all the regulatory uh, hoops that we have to jump through on, to get in the end in the ambulance. But it's a very long road because we have to make sure that we uh, develop our own products. So we need to have a dedicated device that hangs in the ambulance that can actually perform uh, high end EEG measurements in the ambulance. And it has to be very easy to use, even, even easier than we did in the research. It has to be super robust. It has to withstand all the ambulance conditions. And at the same time, we need to show uh, also to the regulators 
that the device is safe to use, uh, that the algorithms are reliable, that the data we use to uh, train our algorithms is also reliable. And we need to show that not in just one study, but in two or uh, three studies, so that it's also a reproducible uh, result. Uh, so that's a quite, a, quite a big effort because at right now we're doing hardware development. So we're developing uh, our own custom hardware to actually be able to accurately measure the EEG in the ambulance. And at the same time, we're also developing our own uh, software to analyze also the data in real time uh, so that we can provide the best data quality and the best user experience for the ambulance personnel as possible. Because in the end, it has to save time and it should not take time to actually do this measure. So there's all kinds of uh, developments going on. And the biggest development, uh, that's something that we work on in the, in the coming time, is also the regulatory aspects. So we have to write a lot of documentation, a lot of documents, which actually show that we adhere to all the norms, uh, all the ISO norms, all the regulations, uh, so that in the end, we get the check mark that we are approved as a medical device. And that's then we have to do that for Europe. We have to do that for the USA. We have to do that for Australia. Uh, and a lot of the work is the same because, but for example, uh, if we have uh, approval in Europe, that does not mean that it's also approved in the United States, for example, because yeah. they ask to do also replication studies there. That means if you want to do a study there, it also means time. And it also means another two, maybe three years before that study ends. Well, the same might be true for Australia. So that's really, uh, well, the challenging part now is to how do we make this available to as many patients as possible? Yeah, because it's very much a uh, it's very much something that should be in every ambulance all around the world if you can manage to get it in there. Yes. Um, but I imagine focusing on uh, uh, on how far widening the scope of the project is and how many people you can implement this uh, process onto and then help would surely be a distraction. It's really then about kind of go trying to go, well, let's just get all our I's dotted here and our T's crossed right here. And let's just make this thing robust, make it work. Let's get the data and let's develop it further and make it, make it what you said. It should save time and not take time. That's what an amazing thing to be considering about, you know, when you're de developing a product, it should be saving time and not taking time. So I love the idea of that. And, um, although I do see you know, massive scope for it, it obviously would be fantastic to know that when it's ready to go to the United States or Australia, that they'd be able to make a quicker decision because you guys have done all the work already and you're getting amazing results in the Netherlands and in Europe, for example. Now, when you are dealing with the Netherlands, um, are you automatically dealing with all of Europe? Or yes, are individual countries then differently set up? Does it being in the European Union breaks that barrier a little? Uh, no. So for the regulatory approval, uh, we we have the CE mark, so it's a bit like the FDA approval. Uh, that's the same across Europe, uh, but that does not mean that the insurance companies and all the ambulance services are organized in the same fashion as well in each uh -huh. country, because there's always going to be small differences uh, but also in essence the problem is the same everywhere because there are stroke patients everywhere there are ambulance everywhere and not every hospital has endovascular treatments and not every hospital will get it as well because uh, it's just impossible yeah. to deliver good care of such high complexity in every hospital yeah and how does a how does a project like this get funded i imagine it takes a lot of resources to get it to the point of actually having a product that's in an ambulance and then developing it further how does it get funded how did you guys manage that mm -hmm. yeah so for for the research phase uh we were actually surprised because usually what happens if you apply for research funding 
uh, you apply for the funding and then you get like a no uh, four times, nine times, and then you get a yes. <laughs> but for, uh, and it also happens for all our other projects, but for this project, uh, for some reason, we don't know why we applied for four projects and we got four yeses. Uh, so we got, uh, well, I wouldn't say easy because it was still a lot of work, but we got relatively easily uh, funded for uh, actually the first ambulance phases. So we started out with crowdfunding uh, of the Dutch Heart of our nation. Uh -huh. uh, so we did a crowdfunding campaign to really get the first uh, 60K in funding to outfit six of those ambulances uh, with EEG devices. And then there were also some uh, commercial companies that actually contributed, uh, just uh, gave us or actually gave uh, Jonathan uh, some uh, funding uh, to also uh, make sure that the ambulance project got on track so that we could speed up a little bit. And with that, we could collect pilot data to show that we could measure EEG data with uh, ambulance personnel. And that actually gave us then the opportunity to go for a slightly bigger grant with other uh, uh, commercial collaborators. Uh, for example, the company that develops the EEG device and the, and the, and the caps. Uh, and another company that works on AI algorithms, uh, also in acute stroke. So with that information, uh, with that consortium, we could then really get to the next stage where we could hire two PhD students. And if you then collect more data, you also have more ideas for new funding and we could apply for the next funding. And this is actually has been ongoing like this. So this is the research funding, but uh, well, I quit my job and I thought, well, it was very easy to get funded. So it's probably going to stay this way. Uh, but then you get in the situation where you have a great idea, you validated it in research, and then you want to, uh, to, to bring it to the patient, which the only way to bring it to the patient is to create a commercial product out of it, uh, because it's, it requires millions of funding to get from the stage where you're in academia, you validated the idea, to the, to the place where you actually have the regulatory approval. So that, that really takes millions and uh, a lot of uh, work for years. And then you need to find somebody that actually is interested, uh, that wants to fund uh, that part uh, all the way to the end, because you, you cannot go halfway because then you have like the half of everything is, is nothing. So uh, that's now the, the tricky part. So we have some uh, two shareholders, Amsterdam UMC, and uh, a company from uh, from Germany that actually believe in this idea, and they funded uh, the first uh, the round uh, with uh, with loans, and actually we got a lot of uh, non dilutive public funding as well. And this is what we're now all using to just reduce the risks in our company, so that we can uh, reduce the risks sufficiently, so that we can attract external investors, because that's really the next step. We need uh, external money also uh, to further uh, develop this ID into a product. And for me, it sometimes still feels weird because we first had the idea, we just want to make impact with our research. Uh, but I now also recognize that you cannot reach that impact. Uh, well, because you also have to be very commercial because otherwise those people who can fund your ID uh, from in the, in the part be after academia, you have to be a little bit commercial because otherwise they won't fund it because What's the, the things that investors want is impact, but they also want return on investment. So right. that's the two things that, uh, well, at first they were a kind of conflict and for me personally, because I'm really a scientist by heart yeah. and I'm slowly moving towards the commercial side. So this is then uh, the next uh, challenge that we have. That's the problem in academia is that the people that are doing it are passionate about their project and they want to get the information out there and they want to discover something and tell you about it and then it stops there and it kind of falls on deaf ears because there's no point putting a financial investment into something if you can't get a return on your investment somewhere down the track i love the idea i love the fact that you guys have slowly but surely the product has molded you people from being researchers or PhD, PhD students to researchers to commercially thinking individuals who now are raising capital, who now are looking for, you know, a whole bunch of ways to solve all these different problems to the, get this thing in the ambulance. In the end, that is exactly 
what's necessary. It's a massive skill set. I imagine it would have been really difficult for you to go from one stage to the other stage to the other stage and to then some at some point you're going I'm not doing what I started out doing I didn't think I was ever going to be raising capital or trying to find money for this is it bizarre to go through all those stages in your journey and end up being this yeah. guy who needs money well uh it's in some way it's bizarre but in this uh, uh I, I also like it a lot because uh down the road you learn a lot uh yeah. on how all the different parts uh of this uh, medtech innovation work because i've worked in the hospital for i think 11 years uh, seven years in neurology and I, i've also done innovation within the hospital just with hospital money within the hospital within the neurology department and the entire uh -huh. hospital uh -huh. and then it's then it's really easy to get innovation through because you just have money coming from one source and the same source benefits and then you just can create a nice product that's really useful for the users yeah. within the hospital but right now we want to create something really for society uh, so you need to be involved with all the stakeholders you need to know what everybody wants and you really learn a lot uh, down the road on all the aspects of uh, yeah, company building, but also on how you can do research better if you would do it next time. Because yeah. uh, all the choices we made were made a lot of sense. Uh, but if I look back, yeah, there's of course always things that also could have been more efficient, better. Yeah. Uh, maybe it was smarter uh, not to publish our uh, our data in a very early stage and just keep everything a secret and then at the end publish everything, uh, but also have more protection for the company. So these are all things that uh, that come down the come down the road. Yeah, I see. Uh, because being then you risk other people taking the idea and trying to get it to market. Well, I'm not that worried about that because uh, our goal is really this technology has to reach the patient. So yeah. if another uh, person reaches the patient earlier, the better. Uh, yeah. But uh, we also want to get our innovation out there uh, yeah. because we think we have a unique data set. It's yeah. actually the largest EG data set in pre-hospital stroke patients. So we really can create also the best algorithms because for algorithms uh, that can make decisions uh, that really can determine uh, life or death, you really need to be sure. So uh, more is more data, more good quality data is better. Uh, and we have that big advantage that we do have that data. And yeah. I don't know if any other uh, research groups or companies actually have so much access to, to this data. Yeah. I, uh, I have one more question before we wrap up. Uh, do you have an idea of the number of people that you'll be able to help. So for example, one in four people in the world will have a stroke in their lifetime. 80% of those will be ischemic strokes. And then I don't know what the data is after that, how many of them are, you know, large vessel, vessel occlusions and all that kind of stuff. So then based on the information, the data that you know, the statistics that you know about stroke and large vessel occlusions, uh, do you know the numbers of people or do you have a hope of what the number of people are that you'll be able to assist further as opposed to when this technology didn't exist. Yes. So I think that uh, each year, uh, if you look at the global picture, we could help 1.8 million people that are now being brought to the wrong hospital. Uh, so uh, I think there is a large opportunity there. And this number is also growing each year with the aging yeah. population. So. I think there are many, many people uh, and added to that, uh, we also see that endovascular treatment gets better and better. So that also more and more people with uh, strokes in slightly smaller vessels can also be helped. So, uh, and also there is of course hemorrhagic stroke. In the end, we also hope that we can detect those type of strokes. So I also hope that we can enlarge uh, as we collect more data in more uh, types of patients that can also increase the number of uh, people that we can help by directing them directly to the right treatment for those patients. Oh, I really certainly hope that you can also then roll it out for hemorrhagic stroke patients. It's definitely an area that seems to be, well, not neglected, but because they're not as common as ischemic strokes, there's less uh, work being yes. done in that space. But nonetheless, I'm a hemorrhagic stroke survivor. And I know a lot of them uh, who have come 
come good and we've had help and have been supported and things are, are going well. So we're not missing out on amazing technology by any stretch of the imagination. Um, that's certain. But what that means is if you're getting a, 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 an, a million, a, an, a, an additional 1.8 million people uh, supported and helped, that is a number of um, an amazing number of people that are going to go back to regular work. They're going to go back to regular life. They're going to be able to go and be a regular part of their community. And they're going, that's going to decrease the number of uh, incidences of disability after stroke. That'll then decrease the number of people that need uh, medical assistance and rehabilitation and time in, you know, off work and all these things and not being a part of their family. I mean, the, the scope for the positive change down the line is massive because that's the thing that I understand is that yeah. once somebody has a stroke, getting back to regular life is a real big task. For me, it took seven years. My whole journey took, it took three and a half, three years to get to surgery, to brain surgery after three bleeds. And then it took another four years to get into a cognitive space where I was capable of holding down a job and being uh, an active member of my community, my family, um, you know, playing the roles that I was playing before as a father, as a husband, as a son, as, as a brother. And it's just the scope down the line seems like it's going to make a really big impact right there where we want it. I've heard of people who have been lucky from thrombectomies where they've been into uh, at the right time, at the right place, exactly the right things everything fell in place for them so they ended up in the emergency room a stroke was diagnosed almost immediately and they had a thrombectomy and within an hour the the clot was removed and then i've also heard of people who have benefited from tpa so this just sounds like it's another awesome move in that part of the process where you guys get to help those guys who implemented thrombectomies as a solution who implemented tpa as a solution you guys get to say to him hey here's another one for you we've got another one for you and we know that way way before we end up in the uh, wrong emergency room yeah that's really what we are what we are trying to do really getting more patients to the right treatment in the right hospital uh, that's really the goal that we have because i recognize also the story that you tell about rehabilitation and uh, how long it takes. Uh, it's really an incredible uh, journey that some people make. And also it's quite incredible what people can achieve even with uh, their disabilities. Yeah. But if we can somehow reduce only a very, very small portion of the disability for an individual, that can really make a huge difference. For example, if somebody can play the guitar again, if he really, really fancies playing guitar, that would change his life. So uh, that's really what I hope to achieve uh, also with our product, getting more people to the right treatments at the right time. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Great, fantastic stuff that you guys are doing. I really love the fact that there are people out there who are researching to find solutions to help people they've never met before. Yes. Thanks a lot for uh for having this podcast and for inviting me. And uh, I hope that uh, also a lot of, uh, yeah, I don't hope for future stroke patients, but I hope also that future stroke patients can find your podcast. because I think they can find a lot of help in there as well. Thanks for joining us on today's episode. Remember, grab a copy of chapter one of the book, The Unexpected Way That a Stroke Became the Best Thing That Happened by visiting recoveryafterstroke.com slash book. Take a look around and discover what the book is all about and click the download free chapter button. As always, to learn more about my guests, including their links to social media and other pages, and to download a full transcript of the entire interview, please go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes. Thank you to everyone who has already left a review. It means the world to me. People are finding the podcast a lot easier these days, and they are telling me that it's one of the best things that happened to them. Finding the podcast helps them to get through their stroke. So if you haven't left a review yet and you don't mind leaving a review, please do on iTunes and on Spotify. Just leave a few words about what the show means to you and 
that was going to make a massive difference for somebody who is looking for this type of content. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, comment below the video. I love seeing the comments. Uh, I respond to all the comments. And to get notifications of future episodes, you have to subscribe to the show, but also hit the notifications bell. Thank you once again for being here and listening. I really appreciate you. See you on the next episode. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call triple zero if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy currency or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk and we are not responsible for any information you find there.